just want to thank you all for coming again, Josh Moody on my far left, and Jackie Hill Perry, and you already know Kevin DeYoung. Uh, Josh, maybe start with you. I read something earlier today from a pastor in England who struggles himself with exclusively same-sex attraction, uh, but is walking with the Lord, committed to lifelong celibacy. And he said that, that what he has heard uh, through a lot of his life is just say no. Just say no to all of your sexual urges, sexual desires. Um, and on the other side, uh, the revisionists are telling him, just say yes. Uh, but he's saying that sort of polarity is, is unbiblical and that there's a different way. Does that make sense to you? And in, in what ways, perhaps, has the conservative church sinned, if that's not too strong a word, by giving a just say no ethic? It, it does make sense to me, that question. You mentioned it to me when we were just out the back earlier. And I think um, uh, Kevin touched on Romans chapter 1, and then as you closed, talked about the way in which, you know, we're all sinners, we all need to repent of various things. I, I'm working through Romans right now we got to Romans 5 after about 10 years or so and um, and it, it was really helpful for me going through Romans chapter 1 and then getting to chapter 2 how he's laying the groundwork he's he's criticizing all the kind of things that the Jewish people at the time were criticizing the pagans for you guys are doing all these kind of things and, and they were you know and then he comes to chapter 2 and he says and by the way you who are so religious you also are without excuse. And I think that whole framework helps with the, you know, uh, how do you put it, people saying, you know, don't do it, and other people saying, do do it, and I'm caught between. In other words, you need somehow, I think pastorally, um, doctrinally, uh, in, in a worldview, uh, I think apologetically for those outside the church, to humble everyone. And until we are all humbled by the, the vision of who God is and the, uh, the contrast of who we are, then it's hard to get out of that polarity. You know, no, yes, and, but one, once you really learn, you realize who you really are, uh, then you begin to uh, move forward in a sort of faithful. I think that's the first step. A lot of other things I could say, but I, know, I don't want to, yeah. Yeah, can I just jump mm-hmm. in? And, th- and this is... No new insight to me. I'm just stealing John Piper, as I usually like to do. Uh, that, you know, the, the, the first time you say, as John Piper said, and then the next time is, um, as one man once said, and then the third time is, as I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so as I always say, you, you, you need to fight the promises of sin with the promises of, of joy. So the text that I've come back to so often been helpful for me in sexual temptation or desire is uh, is Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And I remember very vividly, I won't paint the whole picture, but seeing out of the corner of my eye, person dressed in a way that was not helpful for me to turn my head and look. And it was this verse that, because you, know, you think, what, how, how am I, how is just saying no? How is this really going to hurt me? I mean, to, to, to glance and, and you know, here's, a, here's a young woman, and how, how is this really going to do any damage to me? You know, five seconds, fleeting, whatever. And I just thought of, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so I, I, I wrestled to believe that seeing God will be better than, than seeing this out of the corner of my eye. That there's a, a greater joy. It's not just saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to grit my teeth and, and bear it. But that there is a better joy that God wants to give us. And it's not only a joy that will be eternal, so the joy lasts longer, but it is a, a joy that even in this life will be better, not without cost, not without cross, but that we believe God's promises and take Him at His word such that we can accept that to, you know, for, as a married man, for example, to, to not glance over there and have five seconds of a fleeting pleasure of sin is going to provide more joy for me with my wife in the long run. Uh, it's going to prevent me from falling in the sort of places I shouldn't fall. It, it, God is after my joy. He's after our satisfaction in Him. And I think that's sort of what the, the, the pastor is getting at, the expulsive power of a, of a new affection that we need to be telling people with any manner of temptation or sin, struggle. Don't just say no, but say yes to something better. Jackie, 
you have a passion for this subject and for ministering to people with same-sex attraction. Uh, why? Tell us a little bit about your story and your background. Um, yeah, born in St. Louis, single-parent household, um, fatherlessness, molestation, early uh, pornography, all, just hoping to sin was in my life, um, but also just an inherent disposition to do things that God wasn't pleased with. Um, and so I remember early on, maybe first or second grade, I remember having same-sex attractions um, on the playground in the little, like, plastic cabins and stuff, just really doing um, wicked things uh, with kids that were my age, of course. And as I grew older, around 19, no, around 16 or 17 is when I actually acted out on everything that I had been feeling for a really long time. And it felt completely natural to me. I was like, why haven't I been gay this whole time? Like, boys are gross. Um, but when you I was... going to church throughout hmm, childhood? The f- f- until I was nine, I went to church. Um, didn't necessarily understand what I was hearing or seeing. I think what was more impactful was seeing my aunt, who took me to church her life, and seeing her love Jesus and read the Bible and sing the Psalms, which was so confusing, because I was like, how are you singing this thing that doesn't even rhyme? It was like, (laughs) (laughs) I don't get it. Um, (laughs) And so seeing that, I think, gave me some really early convictions on sin in general. Um, And so when I was in high school, when I acted out on the temptations, it just kind of went full-fledged, started to dress like a boy, act like a boy. going to gay pride parades, gay clubs, uh, along with a, another myriad of sins, drunkenness, weed addiction, stealing, all that type of stuff. But when I was 19, um, I felt God speak to me, not like audibly or nothing like that, but it was just like, just randomly in my room, I, I, I somehow saw the weight of my sin and that it wasn't a theoretical idea that God will judge it or that it was deserving of hell. It really was reality for the first time in my life. And, but at the same time that I saw that my sin was deserving of God's wrath and that it, was, uh, that it would ultimately kill me, I knew that was in the Bible. And it was like, man, if that's in the Bible and it's true, then surely God's grace and forgiveness and kindness and mercy is true too. Um, and so I just considered and weighed my options and saw that I did not have a choice. It's either I choose Jesus or I choose death. Um, but in that, I also knew that it was impossible for me to walk like Jesus without his help. Because I tried. I did the sinner's prayer about 15 times. It never worked. Um, no offense to anybody that does it. Um, <laughs> just didn't work for me. But um, <laughs> when exactly God me. converted me by his supernatural grace, um, I was empowered to do all the things that he loves. And yeah. so now I'm in a place where I have a passion to talk about it because I don't know if people truly believe that one, God is better, and two, that he is actually genuinely, sincerely able to save. Um, yeah. Mm. Amen. When God converted you, did you think um, these desires will remain and I just need to, to live a single life? Or did you think right away, maybe someday I'll get married? Mm-hmm. Or did you have that desire? I had a desire to get married, the idea of marriage, but I did not desire men, if that makes sense. It's like, I want to get married, and I know I can't marry a woman, really don't want to, because women are just really highly emotional, and they kind of got on my nerves. Um, I love them, but they're just like, oh, I need a man sometimes, because y'all just sensitive. But anyway, um, but at the same time, I did not want to be with a man, but I felt God leading me and the idea that if I, if I am calling you to marriage in the future, surely I will empower you and give you the affections and desi- the desires you need to be with that man. Because that would be the means by which you glorify me. Um, and that, that was over time. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't in a rush to be in a relationship, period. Because it was just it's too much stress. You got to call people and go on dates and all that type of stuff. Yeah. And how long ago was that from when God spoke to you in that time about she being the death of you, to now? About six or seven years. I was 19. I'm about to be 26 now. Hmm. Well, your story is, an, I hope we continue to hear more of it as we talk here, but it's an encouragement to all of us, and I'm sure to many people listening here, that God does save and he does transform us. And uh, I imagine as you talk to uh, people who self-identify as gay, whether they self-identify as Christian or not, 
my guess would be that, that some would say you never truly were gay. Right. Or that you uh, are not heterosexual now. Are those the, the sort of things that you hear? I mean, in terms of people questioning your story or questioning your transformation? Often. And it's interesting because to those same people, it's like I, I find it funny that they say that the church is judgmental, but that's judgmental. Mm -hmm. You're saying that you know my experience um, when you don't. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? But also it reminds me of the scriptures when Jesus healed the blind man and like people refused to believe it. It was just like, you weren't blind for real. Like bring your daddy and your mama to prove <laughs> it. <laughs> it's like when a miracle in a sense is in front of you, all you can do is accuse instead of just looking at it and being like, okay, what is God trying to teach me through what he's showing me? Let me believe in this God. And so I think that's, I think that's just the sin nature is I refuse to believe that. So let me tell you that you're lying. Let me read a quote from the pastor that I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, any of you can respond to this. He says, I've spoken to countless church pastors in their forties and fifties who remain committed to what the church has always taught but nearly all of them have said that their children don't even get where they're coming from on this issue. This is a generation who are changing their minds on homosexuality today, not because they're suddenly revising their opinion on the cultural context of Leviticus, the meaning of unnatural in Romans 1, the nature of homosexual practice in Corinth, or the translation of Greek words in 1 Timothy, but because they demand... So my talk, basically. Right. Done. They would <laughs> not be persuaded by Kevin. But because the demand just doesn't seem plausible anymore, it's people, not theology or Greek or Hebrew, that seem to be powering the rejection of the traditional Christian ethic. Agree? Disagree? I mean, I agree. I, my hour-long fire hose made a huge assumption. It presumed upon people here that they were interested in arguments. And following ideas and propositions and consistency and what scholars think. I mean, I, I quoted, what, half a dozen revisionist scholars who said that the Bible teaches everywhere that same-sex intercourse is forbidden. But you're right, that will not make a difference to a whole bunch of people. My, my oldest is 11, so we'll, we'll see what happens in the next 10 years if, if he fits in that category, I hope that uh, he won't, but as, you know, one mutual friend of ours said to me one time, he said, Kevin, you know, the church hasn't, you know, we haven't lost this cultural argument. And I thought, are you, are you, do you have your eyes open? He said, no, because the, the arguments haven't been made. We, we've lost a mood. We've lost mm -hmm. an aesthetic. And how, how, to, how to combat that? I think Hear, hearing stories like, like Jackie's is a powerful, powerful part of it. We were just talking earlier, Justin, that uh, the, the dominant sort of ethic that people breathe in, it's not something they pick up from a book, but is what hurts people is bad. And that's why there's some traction on pro-life issues. You, you can see an ultrasound. You, you can hear women who have regrets. You, there's some sense that, there, yeah, I can see a picture of a life and this is, this is hurting someone, but on this it seems like all the Christian traditional position is doing is hurting people. And we're just beginning to hear of maybe people who, who grew up in same-sex households and how there were challenges there, but it's going to be very difficult if that's the measure of plausibility and the arguments that win the day is just show me who is hurt more, that's where we're falling for, for all of those reasons as you stated because people are not coming to this at a long line of syllogistic reasoning but just because they see their, their friend who's gay or they see stuff on Facebook and they feel like this just doesn't seem like a big deal. And we need to much, much, we need to go much further back with people in our churches and our, and our kids and young people to give a whole reason why you should care what the Bible says about everything and why God is interested in our sexual organs and why, what the incarnation has to do with that and the second coming has to do with it. We, we need a whole big picture. Otherwise, it's going to seem like just a little strange add-on that doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah, just how, how do we instruct and persuade church and culture that, that isn't moved by arguments, even biblical arguments? 
I think it's, uh, I think it's very hard. Um, I was thinking, uh, as, as you were talking about two different women who have talked to me about these kind of issues, and one um, was from a thoroughly non-Christian background, and basically, um, through friendship with other people her age, uh, was introduced to Jesus, met Jesus, and sort of, you know, began to read the Bible after to figure out what the Bible said, what Jesus was saying. I thought, well, I'm following him, therefore I'll follow that. And that's pretty much been her life story. Um, and then another uh, woman who came to talk to me about these issues, who came from a Christian background and wrestled and kept on wrestling these sort of issues. And when I laid out as clearly and graciously as I could um, the sort of Bible's teaching on this and how we're all sinners, how there's this power of Christ in us, this new joy, um, it was, it just, it just couldn't be heard. I think because of some of the cultural mood. And I think that there's this idea that this is like a civil rights issue. It's like the 60s civil rights. And therefore, if you're on the moral side, you'll be campaigning in a different way uh, than the, the Bible speaks. So one of the key tactics I think the church has to make is to explain how actually it isn't a civil rights issue. Uh, and so, yes, stories and um, the church campaigning for other things that the that, that, that culture acknowledges really are civil rights things. Um, I think that can make quite a big difference. But it's that, those two things are always fascinating because of the different trajectories that people have depending upon how they come into the Christian faith. Um, so how, and the, this opened to uh, any of the three of you, people say, you know, Kevin's very impressive and obviously he's a smart guy and he uses big words and he uses a lot of them. Uh, there have been a lot of people, in, which you agree with, of course. Um, Indubitably. What's that? Indubitably. <laughs> <laughs> But there have been smart people in the past who have given sophisticated arguments showing from the Bible, from the original Hebrew, from the original Greek, that God wanted the races to be separated and uh, justified all sorts of things like slavery, uh, the prohibition of, of blacks and whites intermarrying. Um, you know, we, we thought they were right back then. They were sophisticated arguments. They turned out to be wrong. They turned out to be hurtful. Um, in, in what ways, I guess, is uh, gay rights not the new civil rights? I'll let him answer that. <laughs> I mean, I have some thoughts, but I already spoke a lot of thoughts. <laughs> While you're coming up with better answers, I'll just say, hi historically, that's not quite true. It's certainly true that Christians have been wrong before. So... I'll concede that argument. If the argument is Christians have been wrong before, yep, we could could be wrong again. Let, let's look at any, any number of issues to see if we, we could be wrong. But to say that Christians were, for all of 2,000-year history, universally, virtually unequivocally wrong on the same thing. So there were, there were popes all throughout the Middle Ages who were condemning slavery, condemning the slave trade. There was a period in our own history in this country, tragically, where many Calvinist Christians defended slavery and had Bible passages to do so. But to, to make it sound as if, you know, the church has just been benighted on issues of slavery or issues of race for 2,000 years... I don't think it is accurate. Um, and, and that's why on this issue, it, it threatens not only our, our understanding of Scripture, but really the Catholicity of the church. That it's strange in a day where we want to talk about being multicultural and want to listening to the global church. If we listen to the global church, the church in the West wouldn't be tearing asunder these various church communions on this issue because there has been uh, a, a univocal speech on this issue from the church in a way that was never true about some of these other periods and, and patterns where the church has gotten some things really wrong. I think I would add that um, <clears throat> I think in some ways it's mostly a sin issue and can be a civil issue in the sense of when 
people mistreat or disrespect or unkind to a person who is gay, that's a problem. That is a, like, that's, that's just not right. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, me being black or somebody mistreating me because of my color or how that was in the 60s or whatever the case may be, that's not, my color is not a morality thing. That's just genetics. My mom was black, you know what I'm saying? Go back some farther, it might be some Indian in me, I don't know. But <laughs> that's like not a moral issue. Um, and so I think the thing when I'm talking to somebody saying that, hey, God has beef with your behavior or how you choose to act out on your affections. It ain't got nothing to do with nothing else except the fact that God created you and he has the right to define how you should live, period. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think people just don't like that. And so we want to put all these other different titles on it to make it less than what it is, which is that God is coming back and we need to get right. Mm. Yeah. Let me read another quote. This is from uh, another English pastor. Quoting a Lots lot of, of English of pastors. English I mean, I don't know what's... Yeah. I feel really at home some days. <laughs> this is from uh, Vaughn Roberts. He says, in resisting the sexual revolution... Have we not so exalted marriage and the nuclear family, this is something Kevin touched on, mm. that we have marginalized or ignored the Bible's vision of the church as God's family and singleness, whether chosen or not, as a positive vocation? Agree or disagree? Has, has the church idolized in our focus on the family and our desire to build up the, the family, which has been under attack to some degree, has that become an idol and a norm that everybody has to aspire to or they don't feel as if they're quite first-class citizens in the church if they're not part of a mom and a dad and 2.5 kids? Is there something to that and how do we address that or is that the question? Did I, did, I mean, I think, I think he's saying something that's true. Um, and right. there are lots of ways we can address it. So if, if it is true, in what ways, I mean, I think there are a number of pastors here and probably a number of pastors watching on video, in what ways can the church help to equip singles and not make them feel as if in yep. your, if you're right out of college, we've got a place for you, get you in the singles ministry, hopefully get you married off as soon as possible. Yep. But if, you, if it doesn't work, <laughs> then you're sort of stuck That's and right. you pretend like you don't exist. That's right. <laughs> Christian, reasonably attractive. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think some of it's just teaching what the Bible says and so sometimes I find it helpful to point out that Jesus was not married and yet fully um, um, was fully alive in every possible way and, and, and so um, uh, you know living up to that example Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 7 um, not idolizing marriage as the perfect place but being real what, about what marriage is I sometimes joke that when I do uh, pastoral ministry with single people, they're always desperate to get married. And when I'm doing pastoral ministry with married people, they're always, you know, not desperate not to be married, but, they, you know, I want the two to talk to each other sometimes, you know. So um, uh, I think there's certain teaching what the Bible says, a certain reality. I think ultimately holding up Christ as our ideal and realizing that uh, you can be single and fully human and uh, fully um, sanctified. Um, and there are various practical programs you can have as well. We have those sort of things. No, I think, you know, as a pastor, just vocalizing it and, and not doing the things that I'm sure I've, I've done inadvertently all the time. Or, you know, you talk to people and you talk to a single person like they have a disease, you know. So, oh, you're so single. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I mean, I even wonder in some of the language I was using, I'm trying to be pastorally sensitive that, you know, most people I know who are single would, would want to be married, but I don't know. Did I call, I call it maybe a cross? It, it maybe doesn't feel like a, a cross to people. I don't want it to think that it's something wrong with people. And, and just even as a pastor to be mindful, I mean, how many illustrations do I use about my wife, about my kids? No, I think people our understanding and I mean especially if they're cute stories you know they, they follow them but to say that if you do too much of that it gives the impression that that's really what normal life looks like that's what normal Christians are like and some of you are just in that pre-normal stage and you'll get there someday just to even verbalize that to the congregation even to apologize where we've uh, fallen afoul of that I think can really speak powerfully to the single people in our church 
Jackie, were there some ways in which you felt like uh, Christians sinned against you as you came to the Lord, as you tried to be honest about your struggles? And, and do you feel like, in general, the church is a safe place now for those who want to walk with the Lord, want to follow Christian sexual ethics, um, and yet are not feeling attracted to the opposite sex? Hmm. That's a weighty question, Justin. Um, Me personally, I can't say that I felt sinned against um, when I became a believer, but I will say that the guys I know that have come out of the lifestyle are consistently sinned against. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a conversation with a really close friend of mine who we were in the lifestyle together, and he was telling me he, he... He's thinking of, well, he will propose to his girlfriend soon, but he was confessing to her some of his temptations that he still deals with um, as a man who was same-sex attracted, yet still is attracted to her and loves her, and she completely rejected him. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was saying, like, Jackie, when you share your testimony, people applaud you. He was like, every time I share my testimony, whether it's a pastor or my brothers, they all distance themselves from me. Um, And I think that that concerns me is that somehow him being a male and having that testimony is worse than me being a woman and having that testimony. And so I think as Christians and as a church, there needs to be way more empathy um, in the sense of seeing that his sin is no different than yours. His struggles are no different than yours. They are the same. And I think if a man let's say uh, a Christian is able to say, okay, I struggle with pornography. You struggle with homosexuality. It's the same. Therefore, I will empathize with you as a brother in Christ saying, man, let's pray together. You know, like, it, it's okay. Like, and the fact that you're confessing it and broken over it should secure me even more that, like, it's, it's normal. Um, so I think that's something that needs to happen. I don't even know if I answered your question. No, it's good. But, no, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, to, to operate from an assumption that we are all sexually broken. And it's not this category of those out there are sexually broken and we're kind of sexually all put together and, and whole. Um, seems like a crucial assumption. And I'm glad you brought up the issue of empathy because as, as I look out at the church, um, people that are on, quote, the same team as me in terms of wanting to advocate for biblical fidelity a lot of times are not uh, giving the impression that they have much empathy Mm. at all in them uh, to realize that something that I don't struggle with, somebody may deeply struggle with and, and as you mentioned, not have consciously chosen it. Mm. Mm. You've written a little bit, Kevin, about the difference between sin and temptation. We know Jesus was tempted in every way that, that we are, and Jesus never once sinned. So, can somebody be tempted uh, towards same-sex attraction and not sin? And what, what difference does that distinction make in this whole discussion? Yeah, this is really, an, as you know, an ongoing discussion in need of a lot of careful definition. Certainly, biblically, we must have some moral space between temptation and sin for the reasons you gave, Jesus was tempted. Now, theologians would would differentiate the way in which Jesus was maybe tempted from external versus internal. There there is a way in which we can speak of our being tempted in which what we really mean is sinful desires. But James 1 talks about temptation that gives birth, which conceives and then gives birth to sin and when leads to death. So there's some kind of progression there. So that... just use the example I used earlier. So to see out of the corner of my eye, you know, a girl who was washing her car and there's, didn't, didn't look for it, didn't, you know, I I don't have, you know, I'm I'm not spinning out scenarios of where I'm going and all sorts of, but there's just immediate temptation. There's some sort of recognition, apprehension. This is, uh, pleasing to the eye. Do do I turn my head? There's some moral space there between a temptation and then do I act upon that or not. So on the one hand, we want to say that 
this mic is bothering me. And we want to say that desires can be disordered. Desires, Jesus taught, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, that it's not just acting on the lust, but the lust itself. And yet, on the other hand, that there can be temptations that come to us. And so, the, is it possible? This is my phone. Of course, that didn't help. <laughs> there we go. I, I, I hand the baton <laughs> to those whose microphones are not distracting. <laughs> towards the end of your uh, uh, lecture, your talk, you, you described about how someone comes to you and says, you know, pastor, isn't the church meant to be a place for the broken? And you'll say, yes, absolutely, it's for the broken, um, but it's for the broken people who um, want to be healed and are looking for help. And I mean, that, you know, within that distinction, there's a whole sort of mental picture of various kinds of classifications we could make between being tempted, but wanting to flee temptation, you know, rather than looking for temptation and then hoping it will go somewhere else. And I mean, I think pastorally, what we want to help people with is the person who comes and says, I have these desires for persons of the same sex. I didn't want them. I prayed forever that the Lord would change them. He hasn't changed them. I know that, that uh, it's, it's not right. I, I know I don't want to act on it. And I feel like a complete and utter failure and I'm full of shame all the time. What do I do? I mean, that's where we need all yeah. sorts of empathy. We need to help people see there may be elements of that that are temptation, not giving birth yet to sin. Um, there may be desires that simply need to be confessed as disordered desires and, and laid before the cross and where all of us need to be aware of all sorts of desires we have that repentance is a daily act of Christian discipleship. But I think that's where tone and that's where just some empathy can go a long way so that doesn't sound like we're, we're only shouting, we're only trying to speak to Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. uh, yes and amen to people speaking to all those things and I, and I have before but we're speaking to that struggler, that sufferer, that person looking for help. They, they need something quite a bit more sophisticated. Jackie, talk to us a little bit about um, finding identity in Christ because I think identity is a big part of this discussion and uh, maybe even from your own experience of how you thought of your identity when you were in the gay lifestyle versus how you think of it now in light of the gospel. Man, let me try to keep it short. Um, so you don't have to keep it short. Don't keep it short. Don't keep it short. Okay, long-winded Jackie. So <laughs> before Christ, I, I think my identity was everything that I did, um, everything that I felt. So I am a gay woman. I am a weed head. I am a clubber. I am disrespectful. I am arrogant, um, which in all reality, that is what I was. I was a sinner. Um, but I think in Christ, my identity started to shift when I started to allow God's word to define me and not how I felt about myself. And so, for example, I think a big struggle of those who come out of, comes, come out of the lifestyle is they feel the temptations for same-sex attracted and they tell themselves, I must still be gay because this is how I feel, right? Um, but God says, no, you're my friend, you're a saint, you are redeemed, you are a Christian, like your temptations no longer define you. What I've done for you and your faith in that is what makes you new. That's what defines you. Um, and so I think the reading of the scriptures and really believing what Jesus had to say about me um, is what changed me and ultimately gave me a lot of freedom. Because when I begin to and continue to define myself by how I feel and my attractions and my affections, it's completely and utterly discouraging because I'm so concentrated on the, uh, the wickedness in me and that old person that I'm no longer like delighting and finding hope in the fact that Jesus promised to help me when I'm struggling, that Jesus said to every temptation, I will give you a way out, um, and that they're, like all the promises of God are like yes in Christ like that is so much hope for people for Christians for human beings um, and so just digging into Ephesians 1 and like reading Desiring God sermons about it um, y'all know what Desiring God is? No? John Piper? No? Yeah. <laughs> He's Kevin, like one of the best people. I thought Kevin DeYoung wrote that. Yeah. yeah like, like Ephesians 1 just really jacked me up like 
like, come on, man, like, yeah. So, <laughs> does that make sense, though? Yeah. yeah, allowing the scriptures to define who you are and not how you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, because you will be very, very discouraged. And even if, even if, if you do it to yourself, you'll ultimately allow the world to do it to you, too. Um, whether you have friends in your circles that don't know. Man, like, just be you. Like, if that's how you feel, then that means that's you. It's like you have to fight against those lies and say, no, because I repented and believed, and God has changed me and filled me with his spirit. I am no longer that. I am new, and I will walk in that newness. Um, yeah. So this, this may be the most controversial question of the night, but uh, does uh, godliness require heterosexuality. In other words, to be converted, does that mean you have to be converted to having only desires for the opposite sex or else you're sinning? Or can somebody be a godly, Christ-like person, experience same-sex attraction and temptation, and yet resolve by the power of the Spirit they will walk with Christ in faithfulness and not act on any of those desires. There may, I don't know what your answers yeah, will all be. Well, that, that's a really easy question, isn't it, Justin? And um, I, I think that um, some of this comes back to uh, tracing a really big biblical theology. So in a sense, um, uh, you go back to, to Genesis and you look at uh, you know, God's big picture about marriage. And you have that as the template you go all the way to Revelation, and you see that there's a, a celestial marriage at the end. And so that uh, it seems impossible to doubt that from a biblical framework uh, that the, the template for sexuality, you know, marriage, Paul talks about, uh, is, is a mystery. It's a type. It's a sign pointing something to Christ. So th th that's the template. So... Th so uh, I, I, the, the, the terminology heterosexual and homosexual, I mean, uh, these are terminologies that have the, all their loaded kind of semantic range that's defined by all sorts of cultural things that we could spend hours, um, you know, pulling apart and questioning and all that sort of thing. But if you're talking about the template of marriage in Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, that, that surely is the template. On, you know, on the other hand, you, you could say the same sort of question about something like ambition, would it be true that, you know, the only way for a truly godly man uh, to be completely like Christ is to have the kind of ambition that Philippians talks about? Well, the answer to that would be yes. And, you know, how many of us this side of glory will be close to that? The answer to that would be not many. Uh, so we, we have to hold out the template unashamedly, both prophetically to the powers that be and pastorally um, at the same time, um, as well as acknowledging that those in Christ are uh, defined, identity defined by being in Christ and now have his righteousness, at the same time are on a journey of becoming gradually more like they have been declared to be. And that would be true in sexuality, it would be true in ambition, it would be true in jealousy, to add to that, I would, I remember when um, I felt God leading me out of that lifestyle, I immediately equated salvation with heterosexuality. God, if you're calling me, that means you're calling me to be straight. And by God's grace, I came to realize that when God is calling me, if God is calling me out of my sin, he's not calling me to this relationship or a marriage. He's simply calling me to himself, mm -hmm. period to enjoy him, to know him, to love him, and the outworking of doing those will result in holiness. Um, even in the midst of having same-sex temptations, I'm still called to be holy. You know, I may not be called to be married, which I was, glory be to the Lord. Not, no offense to the sick people, I just love my husband. Um, but <laughs> I was called to that. But if I wasn't, I would still be glorifying God in my singleness because I know that the aim is to simply know him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as they said, they're such loaded terms, and they're relatively recent terms, and there are all sorts of assumptions we have on the other side of Freud about conscious and subconscious, and I remember one of my professors in, in college just sort of blew my mind. I just, we always use that word, and he said, you know, Christians, in 
use that language until after Freud. It's like, who's Freud? And what? That's just what we talk about. So all of these sort of, well, what is heterosexual? What is homosexuality? How does this work? I think the question you're getting at is what if a person, their whole life, when they see somebody of the same sex, that thing happens, that spark, that chemistry, that mm, I'm noticing something in it, you know, that most people experience when they see someone of the opposite sex. You're saying if that, that never happens with seeing somebody from the opposite sex, but, but happens that kind of, I know that I'm in the room, I know that, that a, a pretty woman is sitting next to me, that whole thing. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we see in Scripture that that has to happen for someone of the opposite sex in order to prove that one is redeemed. What we see is the outworking of that obedience. Now, at the same time, we want to hold out that, as we've heard here powerfully tonight, that those desires can change. They can change slowly. They can change quickly. They can change dramatically, completely, partially. So those desires can change. That the desire is, in, in some sense, a not the way things are supposed to be, God designing men for women. And there are all sorts of things about us that are not the way they're supposed to be that require a daily repentance and dying to self, even when that spark chemistry thing may not happen the way it does for most of our friends. And we need to be really sympathetic and challenging and understanding with our brothers and sisters who have that experience. All right, I have two more questions. Uh, one for you, Kevin, and then close one for you, Jackie. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about marriage. We've, we've touched on it a little bit. I'm talking about gay, so-called gay marriage, not um, opposite sex marriage. Uh, what would you say, Kevin, to somebody here, somebody watching, who says, I agree with every single jot and tittle of your talk, um, I, am, I buy into all of the exegetical arguments. Every uh, act of same-sex intimacy, sexual behavior is sinful. It should not be done. Um, it has no place in the church. But we're Christians. We have to, you know, judgment begins with the household of God. It's not our place to tell other people who are not Christians that they have to conform to our ethic. And who are we to deprive people of the joy of marriage? Even if we disagree with it, we live in a pluralistic culture. Uh, what are we, you know, how are, how are they harming themselves to, to call it a marriage even if we don't agree with it? Why? So a short way to ask my long-winded question is, can somebody believe that homosexual behavior is sin but that Christians should support same-sex marriage? Well, certainly people do, and I run into those people uh, not infrequently. I agree with those conclusions. That's what I believe as a Christian, but that's not what some people believe. And so, you know, there's going to be different kinds of marriage, just as you said. Now, the way you said it, um, you know, and they can have this relationship and call it marriage, which, of course, there is no law on the books in any state um, that prevents two people from having a relationship and calling it marriage. The debate is whether the government will call it marriage and recognize it as marriage and privilege it as marriage with all of the rights thereunto. That, that's the, the question. Not a matter of, I mean, since the Supreme Court case in um, early 2000s struck down the Texas law, there, there's, there aren't laws against uh, sodomy. So we're dealing with whether or not the government will recognize same-sex unions as marriage. And there's all sorts of arguments that can be made why they shouldn't, and we as Christians should be concerned about that. And it's not simply to say, well, that's because that's our view as Christians. It's to talk about the well-being of children. It's to talk about uh, whether or not that demeans all marriage, because marriage has now become something constitutively different so it's no longer the, the union of a man and a woman which is ordered around the raising of offspring, but it is fundamentally a companionship chosen. And we're already seeing there's three parent laws uh, in California. These are not slippery slope arguments. These are logical deductions from presuppositions about marriage, that if marriage is not fundamentally oriented around children, around procreation, around this conjugal 
differentiation and union, then it becomes whatever two or more persons who want to make commitments to each other can make. And to those uh, who, on libertarian grounds, that's what we often find, well, look, I I want the government to get out of this. I want less government. I want, you know, just let let people want to get married, get married. I'd say, no, it is ceding to the government, actually, a tremendous amount of heretofore unknown power and authority to redefine what marriage is. Because in the traditional view, marriage is what's called a pre-political institution. That is, government recognizes marriage because government has an interest in preserving and privileging um, the marriage relationship. That's, that's the whole reason government gets into the marriage business because it has a vested interest in human flourishing and in the stability of society to see that as much as possible a mother and a father are the ones who raise their children. Uh, when government recognizes it as a pre-political institution, that's one thing. But now we're saying marriage has no oughtness. There, there is no is to marriage, but it is what the government has now defined it to be. So it's actually giving to the government a tremendous amount of power to redefine our, our most intimate relationships and is dangerous. And if, if, if we think that a grand bargain can be made whereby we'll sort of get out of the way on this and then we'll have our religious freedom, I think, sadly, that will not be the case. Thank you. Jackie, uh, we've covered a lot of ground here tonight. Kevin's given a, a really eloquent address on the objections and exegesis, and we've gotten into politics, and we've gotten into you know, some pastoral care issues. Just conscious of the fact that you know there could be somebody here. We don't know how long this video will remain online. Somebody who stumbles across this video, who tends to think of church and Christianity as as mainly do's and don'ts and religious rules. And uh, again, you're a wonderful trophy of God's grace of being transformed by the gospel. And I wonder if if you could summarize in in a, a short amount of space, what is the gospel? You know, we're, we're gospel people, we're in a church here, we're talking about Christian issues, and I, I don't want this evening or this video to be done without being crystal clear on what is the gospel of Jesus Christ and what can it do to um, people who don't understand who God is and who need grace. There's this thing... Um... I like reading Genesis because, well, the story of Adam and Eve, because I see so much of my own sin issues in that one story, which is just super deep. But um, you see Adam and Eve, and you see God being all wise and loving and caring and being the creator and being Lord and telling them, hey, um, just do what you want. Of, of course, oh, baby, but just have fun, have joy, have pleasure in me, um, but just, just do not eat this one thing, this one tree, and if you eat of it, you will die, period. Um, Then Eve, don't know how long it took for her to just start tripping, but (laughs) she trips, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) But (laughs) um, it didn't take long for her to start having this conversation with Satan. And in this conversation, she started to doubt that God was what he said that he was and that he would do what he said that he would do. And she started to believe and put faith not only in Satan, but in how she felt. And it it, it boggles my mind how she saw this tree and God told her, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. But somehow in her unbelief, she saw good qualities in the thing that God said would kill her. And that just is, is, is crazy. And so she ate the fruit, sin entered into the world when she passed it on to her, her passive husband. Um, and so now we all have this predicament where he was passive. We have this predicament where we find joy in all the things that are bad for us. We find pleasure in all the things that will kill us. Um, and I think ultimately we don't see that none of these things will fully ever truly satisfy us. In our minds, we think they will, but they don't. That's why we go to sleep um, as an unbeliever, just super empty in some ways. But God is so gracious and so loving and so kind that he, he, he created us for himself. And he says, you know what? I'm going to send my son to live the life that you cannot live. And he's going to die the death that you deserve. 
And on the cross, he took the penalty of, of uh, our sins on himself and resurrects from the grave with all power in his hand and commands us to repent and believe in his name. But all of that is real cute and theological when you just kind of forget the fact that God made provision for us to know him. To just know him, to know the creator of the universe, to know the Lord of lords, the king of kings, to know the God that angels stand before and can't even look at. They just say, holy, 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 the Lord God almighty. God died for human beings that did not want him so that they may know him and enjoy him forever. And I think that's the beauty of the gospel that sometimes gets left out by a bunch of do's and don'ts. Because when you get to know Jesus, you willingly and with joy want to do what he says do because you know that is a means by which you can know him better. Um, and so that was, that's, that'd be my encouragement. It's not that we're calling you to just stop doing all these things just for the sake of doing it. We're saying once you see Jesus and once you see God and see that he is what he says that he is and that he will do what he said that he will do, you will be happy in him. And even being happy in him doesn't mean that you won't have suffering. Doesn't mean that you won't have pain. It means that you have contentment and joy in the midst of it. Because one day we'll be free and happy and have no shackles on us forever in heaven. But until then, we need to know God on earth and spread his aroma to everybody. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you deeply that every word that Jackie just said was true. Because though every man be a liar, your truth remains. We thank you that you are altogether lovely. We thank you that you are powerful. We thank you that you are holy, that you are good, that you are the only wise God. And we thank you that you have stooped low, sending your son, Jesus, to become man, to face every temptation known to man, and yet to remain sinless and to be obedient even to the point of death, death on another tree, and to rise triumphantly from the grave and to return to your right hand, sending forth his spirit to change us, to transform us, to make us new creatures so that the old is gone, the new has come. Lord, I pray for pastors who are here, who are watching this, that they would speak the truth boldly and with brokenness, knowing that we are all fallen short of your glory. I pray for those, Lord, who are struggling, those who feel ashamed of having these desires that they did not consciously choose that they would give anything to be rid of. You have given them this limp, and I pray that they would walk faithfully, carrying this cross and looking to you and to you alone. We pray, Lord, that you would create faithful churches, not only in the United States, but around the world. And we pray that you would create safe churches, not that rail against certain sins, but know that your grace is sufficient, that your word is true, and that the most loving thing in the world to do is to tell the truth in love with grace. Lord, I thank you for Kevin. I thank you for Jackie. I thank you for Josh. I thank you for this evening that you have put together, and we pray that it would honor and glorify your great name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.